Well, they asked if they could live up some of the decorations for the Christmas play this Saturday, and I said, sure, why not? <laughs> it kind of creeping me out. <laughs> I mean, you know, when I go speak at other churches, um, even big churches, 18, 2,000 seat churches, those are big churches. When there's no windows in the back, I still feel kind of creepy. It's like I just feel kind of closed in. So with the windows closed up, I, yeah, I'm kind of freaked out. Well, Second Chronicles chapter 21. 2 Chronicles chapter 21. Now you recall at the death of Solomon, the third king of Israel in 930 BC, Israel was divided into two major camps. You had 10 tribes to the north called Israel and two tribes to the south called Judah. And we had mentioned that here in 2 Chronicles chapters 10 through 36 verse 21 deal primarily with the 20 kings in the southern kingdom called Judah, four of which we've already looked at. We've looked at Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, and then the last king we looked at last time we were together, of course, was Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat was a very good king. However, he wasn't perfect. He had his faults and he had his flaws. Uh, he allowed his son to marry uh, the daughter of Ahab, the wicked king to the north. And then he made an alliance with his son-in-law, Ahaziah, to build ships there in the area of the Gulf of Aqaba, which ended up in a huge disaster. And while he wasn't perfect, he was a good king. And in all of that, we saw really a, a beautiful picture of, of all of us because none of us are perfect. Okay, that was pretty weak. Uh, now I know we're coming into the Christmas season and there should be a lot of jolliness and whatnot, but the truth of the matter is we're all pretty flawed and we have a lot of faults. Just ask the person sitting next to you, they'll straighten you out. <laughs> but as with Jehoshaphat, man, he walked with the Lord, and therefore there's hope for all of us. Well, this brings us to chapters 21 and 22 in our study for today, where we're going to look at three more people in the southern kingdom. Two of them are kings. One of them is a queen. Oh, yes, there was a queen in the southern kingdom. So let's take a look at the first king we want to look at. His name is Jehoram. Jehoram. That's in 2 Chronicles chapter 21. His name means Jehovah is exalted. He will become the fifth king of Judah, the southern kingdom. He, of course, is the son of Jehoshaphat. He will reign for eight years, from 848 to 841 BC. And we would mention four things about King Jehoram. Number one, let's take a look, first of all, at the evil from Jehoram. The evil from Jehoram. Uh, that's in verses 1 through 6. In 2 Chronicles 21.1, it says, And Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers. He died and was buried and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, or there in Jerusalem. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. He had brothers, the brothers, uh, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, Jehel, Zechariah, Azarahu, Mikael, and Shephathiah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel, or the brothers of Jehoram. Now, according to verse 3, their father gave them great gifts of silver and gold, precious things, with fortified cities in Judah. But he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. So seven sons in all, Jehoram, of course, being the firstborn, which entitled him to the throne. And he, of course, became king at the death of his father, uh, Jehoshaphat. Now, according to verse 4, when Jehoram was established over the kingdom of his father, 
he strengthened himself and killed all his brothers with the sword and also others of the princes of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem from uh, 848 to 841 B.C. And he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Now, all 20 kings of the northern kingdom called Israel were evil Kings, there was not one good king among them. So he walked in the way of the northern kings of Israel, which of course was evil. Just as the house of Ahab, who was the eighth king of Israel, the northern kingdom, and his wife Jezebel had done, for he had, uh, for he had the daughter of Ahab, which is Athaliah, as a wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, presumably, Jehoram was threatened by his brothers, and subsequently, he cut them all down with the sword. He drew his sword and cut them down. Now, that's kind of an interesting picture, uh, because when we feel threatened by others, Oftentimes, we have a tendency to pull our sword, the Bible, and cut them down. We love to use scripture to tear other people down. Well, you know, not us, but people at other churches have this problem. We love to tear them down, and the reason we do it is because, well, I mean, after all, we're right and they're wrong, amen? And by golly, I'm not going to let them get away with that, and I'm going to pull out my sword, the word of God, and I'm going to really lay into them. And boy, what an interesting picture that paints. But you know, even when we're right, it's okay to be wrong. You say, Clark, are you sure? Oh yes, absolutely. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7, he says, why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? You know, when we... <laughs> exhibit pride in our life, it indicate, it's often indicated by the fact that we have to let everybody know we're right and they're wrong. Sometimes it's be just better to be wrong, to be cheated, and allow God to work his work in the life of that person apart from us. And that oftentimes is humility. Now, it's interesting in verses 5 and 6, we're told he reigned for eight years. He, of course, married Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab, the eighth king of the north, the, the evil king. Now, Jehoram marrying Athaliah is significant for two reasons because it points to two very valuable lessons for us. Number one, we need to be very careful who we marry. Hello? I mean, this means no missionary dating, by the way. Thinking, ooh, you know, but he's so cute. I know if I could just, you know, get him saved, he'll be perfect. Oh, really? Hey, we need to be careful. Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, that we're not to be unequally yoked with non-believers. We're to be different from them. We're to come out from among them, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, and be separate, says the Lord. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, that bad company corrupts good habits. So I think, number one, we need to be very careful who we marry. But number two, we need to be very careful what we do. Note carefully there in verses five and six that the reason Jehoram did evil is because of his wife, Athaliah. Wow. Now, okay, let me, let me clarify this for a moment. The point is, gals, God has given you a great and awesome privilege and responsibility as a wife to have a big impact on your husband's to have a significant impact on what your husbands do and how they act. I mean, have you ever wondered why I'm so perfect? <laughs> it's Sally. The impact she has on my... <laughs> 
Okay, she hasn't been that impactful, obviously. <laughs> but the, okay, because I'm pretty messed up. Okay, good, you got that, fine. The, <laughs> listen, listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, dealing with wives and husbands, listen to this. He says, likewise, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some of your husbands do not obey the word, they, your husbands, without a word, a word from you, may be won by the conduct of their wives. Wow. When they observe or see your chaste conduct accompanied by fear or reverential awe of who God is. Do not let your beauty be that word, that outward adorning or arranging of the hair or wearing gold or putting on fine apparel, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is a very precious thing in the sight of the Lord. For in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands. And Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Wow. Two things to note there, gals. Number one, Paul is not obviously, he's not condemning adorning the hair and getting dressed up and wearing jewels. And he's not, he's not Peter's not condemning that. Uh, please don't misunderstand. There's nothing wrong with getting dressed up and fixing your hair and looking nice. He, uh, in fact, I, I like what J. Vernon McGee used to say. He said, if the barn needs painting, paint it. <laughs> but there's a second important thing to note there in verse 6. Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord, yeah. Just saying. <laughs> now, obviously, I'm kidding. But the point is, gals, God has blessed you with a wonderful opportunity to have a great impact on your husband. There's no question about that. Because Peter talks about that gentle, quiet, humble, sweet spirit. A spirit that exemplifies the love of Jesus Christ. And you can win your husband over without a word, by your conduct, by your action. And what a wonderful thing God has blessed you gals with that to do. Now guys, this certainly doesn't mean that we're off the hook. There's no doubt about that. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse seven, that the woman is the glory of the man. Isn't that interesting? In other words, the woman is the reflection of her husband, we would say. Wow. Have you ever wondered why Sally is so perfect? <laughs> okay, she's pretty messed up. Fine. <laughs> Okay, not as messed up as me, but. So guys, if you don't like what your wives are up to, what they're into, we better take a look in the mirror at ourselves. Because the woman is the glory of man. Back to Second Chronicles chapter 21. Let's come to the second thing about Jehoram. We've looked at the evil from Jehoram. Number two, let's take a look at the apostasy by Jehoram. The apostasy by Jehoram. That's in verses 7 through 11. Take a look. In 2 Chronicles 21, 7, it says, Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David, or we would say the southern kingdom of Judah, because of the covenant, the promise that he had made with David, the second king of Israel. And since he, God, had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. Now, this promise was back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 16, when God promised King David that he would have an heir sit on his throne. 
always, as long as the throne was there. Now, of course, if the throne wasn't there, there wouldn't be a physical heir sitting on the throne. However, this prophecy certainly looks forward and finds its ultimate fulfillment in the Messiah, in Jesus Christ himself, who will come and establish the King of David forever. In his days, verse 8, the Edomites, uh, the tribe that lives below the Moabites on the southeastern side of the Dead Sea, revolted against Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. So Jehoram went out with his officers and all his chariots with him, and he rose by night and attacked the Edomites who had surrounded him and the captains of the chariots. Thus the Edomites have been in revolt against Judah's authority to this day. And at that time, Libna revolted against his rule. Libna is southwest of Jerusalem. Because, notice why, because he had forsaken the Lord God of his fathers. Moreover, he made high places in the mountains of Judah, speaking of worshiping false gods, and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit harlotry and led Judah astray. Here, interestingly enough, we see Jehoram had a lot of problems. He had problems from without, from the Edomites. He had problems from within, with those from Libna, just southwest of Jerusalem. And all of his problems that, were, that came from without and came from within was the direct result, according to the end of verse 10, because of his apostasy, because he had forsaken the Lord. He had turned his back on the Lord. And you know, family, anytime we forsake the Lord, anytime we turn our back on the Lord, we're going to have problems. <laughs> There's going to be problems from without. There's going to be problems from within. There's going to be problems all over the place. And I'm always amazed how we think that somehow we can go it without God that we can go it alone, that somehow we don't need the Lord and we subsequently turn our back on the Lord. Now, of course, we would never turn our back on the Lord as it pertains to salvation, to eternal life, but how oftentimes do we turn our back on God as it pertains to the, the situation or circumstances we're dealing with in our own lives on a daily basis? thinking that somehow, well, I can handle this. I can take care of this. I can get through this. I'm not gonna bug God with this. You know, he's probably too busy. Hey, are you kidding me? We need to be absolutely dependent upon the Lord in each and every situation because apart from Jesus Christ, we're helpless. We're hopeless. In fact, Jesus said that, by the way, in John 15, 5. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah. We can do nothing apart from Christ. But when we turn to the Lord, when we cry out to the Lord, when we rely upon the Lord, now all of a sudden we receive help from the Lord. And now, now there's going to be victory. There's going to be an ability, an empowerment in our own hearts and in our lives to get through what we're going through. That's why Paul said in Philippians 4.13 that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, that you and I are more than conquerors. Well, back to 2 Chronicles chapter 21. Let's come to the third thing we want to look at. We said there were four in dealing with Jehoram, the fifth king of Judah. We saw evil from Jehoram. Now, we looked at the apostasy by Jehoram. Now, number three, let's take a look at the prophecy for Jehoram. In verses 12 through 15, we have a prophecy for Jehoram. Take a look. In verse 12 of 2 Chronicles 21, it says, And a letter came to him, speaking to, of Jehoram, from Elijah the prophet. Now, this is Elijah the prophet. Elijah means Jehovah is God. Jehovah, which becomes very interesting back in 1 Kings chapter 18, but that's a story for another day. But Elijah is actually a prophet to the northern kingdom called Israel. He wasn't a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. In fact, when Jehoram became king in 848 BC, Obadiah became a prophet 
to the southern kingdom of Judah. So Obadiah was in Judah prophesying, but Elijah writes a letter to the southern kingdom of Judah to Jehoram. Now this is pretty significant for two reasons. Number one, this is the one and only letter we have from Elijah. Everything else is simply recorded for us as to what he had said. Here, we actually have a letter from Elijah. Kind of interesting. But the second important thing to note about this is that in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, Elijah was caught up in the whirlwind. We all know the story. God sent a fiery chariot down to get Elijah, but he went up in the whirlwind in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. The reason that's so significant is because Elijah wrote that letter before he got caught up in the whirlwind. And he got caught up in that whirlwind in 848 BC, before Jehoram even became king of Judah. Isn't that interesting? Or not. You say, <laughs> you say well, Clark, how come he wrote this letter before he was even king? Well, I think for two reasons. One, to validate the fact he's a prophet, obviously. I mean, you write a letter like that and then it happens, then that's pretty powerful testimony to the validity of his being a prophet. But I think there's a second important reason he wrote this letter before Jehoram became king. And that is to give Jehoram an opportunity to repent. He told him what he was going to do before he did it. So hopefully he wouldn't do it. Like God did back in Genesis chapter 3. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 3? In Genesis chapter 3 verse 13, God appeared to them in the garden and he said, What have you done? Like God didn't know. Of course God knew what Adam and Eve did. He's God. He knows everything. He knows what you're thinking right now. So why did God say that to Adam and Eve? What did you do? No doubt to give him an opportunity to confess, to repent, to get right with God. And that, listen gang, that points to and speaks of the fact that God is long suffering. <laughs> God is so merciful. He puts up with so much in our lives. He's so gracious, so long. In fact, Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he said, the Lord's not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but he is long-suffering toward us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In Romans chapter 9, verse 22, the Bible says that God is long-suffering. He is just so merciful. And what a wonderful picture that paints for us. Because the truth of the matter is we oftentimes become very short with others. Hello? We become so short with them. We don't put up with their nonsense. I mean, come on. <laughs> and, and we just, we fall right into it. It's so easy for us. Because we, of course, have it all together and they're messed up. Hey, are you kidding me? Oh, that we too would be that long suffering with others, such as God is with us. Well, number four and finally, let's wrap up this first king right here. The fourth and final thing involves the death of Jehoram. Number four, the death of Jehoram. That's in 2 Chronicles 21, 16 through 20, the end of the chapter. Take a look. In verse 16 of 2 Chronicles 21, it says, Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines and the Arabians who were near the Ethiopians. And they came up into Judah and invaded it and carried away all the possessions that were found in the king's house and also his sons and his wives so that there was not a son left to him except Jehoahaz, the youngest of his sons. Now Jehoahaz will be the only son left to Jehoram. Now 
Jehoahaz, as we'll see in just a moment in chapter 22, verse 1, is called Jehoahaz, is called uh, uh, Ahaziah, Ahaziah. And when we get to verse 6 of chapter 22, he's called Azariah. So he, all three names are good, whether it's Jehoahaz, Ahaziah, or Azariah. All three names are good names for this final son of Jehoram. Now, according to verse 18, after this, the Lord struck him in his intestines with an incurable disease. Then it happened in the course of time, after the end of two years, that his intestines came out because of his sickness. That's nasty. <laughs> so he died in severe pain. And his people made no burning for him. In other words, they, they didn't uh, celebrate him like the burning for his fathers. He was 32 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years and, no, and uh, to no one's sorrow. Nobody mourned his death. However, they buried him in the city of David there in Jerusalem, but not in the tombs of the kings. Now here the death of Jeroboam was very slow and very painful. Whatever kind of intestinal disease he had, after two full years, his intestines subsequently came outside of his body. I don't know how, nor do I want to. And he subsequently died. And I think there's two important things to note about the death of Jehoram. Number one, Jehoram's sin not only affected him, but affected his whole family. It infected the whole kingdom. Enemies came in, they took the spoils of war, they took his wives, they, they took his sons. And if we think sin in our life only affects us, well, we're fooling ourselves. Look, sin will always affect those around us. But I think there's a second important thing to understand about Jehoram's death. And that is the result of his sin was death, but it didn't come immediately. In fact, he might even, even thought he got away with his sins. But he didn't. Oh, it caught up to him. Oh, it took a couple of years and it was very long and very painful. But sin always has a way of catching up to us. Look, if we think we can live a life of sin and we're going to get away with it, like somehow we're fooling God, hey, are you kidding me? Hebrews 4.13 says there's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to him to whom we must give an account. We're not fooling God. In fact, in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, Moses said, be sure your sin will find you out. Look, payday, one day to be sure. Well, Let's come to the second king we want to look at, and that is Ahaziah. Ahaziah. Now, as we've mentioned, back in chapter 21, verse 17, he's called Jehoahaz, but typically he's referred to as Ahaziah. Now, he is uh, uh, mentioned here in 2 Chronicles chapter 22, and we would just mention three things about him, and they go very quickly. Number one, First of all, we have some information about Ahaziah. That's in verses 1 and 2. In 2 Chronicles 22.1, we have information about Ahaziah. It says, Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah his youngest son king in his place. For the raiders who came with the Arabians came into the camp and killed all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Now, he reigned for one year in 841 B.C. He, of course, is the sixth king of Judah. And as we've already mentioned, uh, he goes by three names. He goes by Jehoahaz, Azariah, and Ahaziah, as mentioned here. Now, according to verse 2, it says Ahaziah was 42 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year 
in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. She was actually the daughter of King Ahab, the eighth king of Israel, whose wife, of course, was Jezebel. Now, you say, wait a minute, Clark. It says in verse 2, he was 42 years old when he became king. Yes, that's true. But doesn't it say back in verse 20 of chapter 21 that his father, Jehoram, was 40 years old when he died? Yes, it does. That's a good trick. Um, (laughs) There's a Clearly, there's a copyist error here in dealing with his age being 42. Uh, The Hebrew writing is um, uh, very unique in the sense that one little jot or tittle could change the numerical value. And this should be reading 22, not 42. And for those of you who read and write Hebrew, uh, you understand what we're talking about, how easy it is to uh, misinterpret these writings. And I know a couple of you do. Now, this brings us to the second thing we want to look at. Uh, We've looked at information about Ahaziah. Now let's take a look at the counsel for Ahaziah. The counsel for Ahaziah. Look at verses 3 through 6. In chapter 22, verse 3, it says, And he he also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, the king of Israel, there in the north. For his mother counseled him to do wickedly, which is Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. Therefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab. For they were his counselors after the death of his father, who, of course, was Jehoram to his destruction. He also walked in their council and went with uh, Jehoram, the son of Ahab. Now, this, of course, is not his father. This is the son of Ahab, whose name also happens to be Ahaziah's father's name, Jehoram, who is also called Ahaziah uh, when we see it in another account, but that's a different story. He's the king of Israel to make war against Hazael, king of Syria, Ramoth Gilead, and the Syrians wounded Joram. Now Joram and Jehoram are the same guys. They're both the sons of Ahab in verse 5. Then, verse 6, he returned to Jezreel, the valley of Jezreel, there in the beautiful valley of Megiddo, from the wounds which he had received at Ramoth when he fought against Hazael, king of Syria. Now, Ramoth Gilead is on the east side of the river Jordan. And Azariah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah. Now, as we've mentioned, Azariah is also called Ahaziah, and he is also called Jehoahaz. So this particular Azariah is Jehoahaz or Ahaziah, the son of Joram. And I hope you're getting this. There will be a test afterwards. He went down to see Jehoram, the son of Ahab in Jezreel because he was sick. So here we see the counsel for Ahaziah. Now I can't even imagine a mother counseling their son to do wickedness, but she did and so did everyone else. And since he received that counsel, he did it. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And you know, for us, there's great wisdom in receiving counsel. There's no doubt about that. In fact, Proverbs 11:14 says, without counsel, the people perish. But where there's multitudes of counselors, there is safety. Or there's, uh, there's peace in a multitude of counselors. But the question for us is, what kind of counsel are we getting? Because here's the problem we often face. When we go through a difficult situation, we go to our friends, our family members, our loved ones, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. 
But the problem often lies in that our friends and our loved ones and our family members feel so bad for us. Their heart breaks for us when we go through a difficult situation. So the counsel they give us is always to kind of get us out of this situation or to make us feel better, or try to ease the pain. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that because that's what friends and family do. We, we, we grieve when others grieve. We, we mourn when others mourn. And we come alongside and we try to help. But what we really need to look at is no matter what anybody says, whether it's friend, family, or not, does it line up with the Word of God? Is the counsel they're giving us the counsel from the Scriptures? Because the Bible is really the ultimate counselor for each and every one of us. Well, number three, and finally, let's take a look at the death of Ahaziah. The death of Ahaziah, or Azariah, or Jehoahaz, as he's also called. Uh, that's in verses 7 through 9. In 2 Chronicles 22, 7, it says, His going to Joram was God's occasion. Now, Joram, or Jehoram, is the son of Ahab, the king of Israel in the north. That was an occasion for Ahaziah's downfall. For when he arrived, he went out with Jehoram, or Joram, against Jehu, the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. Now, back in 2 Kings chapter 9, Elijah was called to anoint three men to be judges and executioners for the northern and southern kingdoms, if you will. But Elijah, of course, was caught up. So Elisha picked up his mantle and took his place. And Elisha had anointed Jehu, which is a commander of the army. He's the son of Nimshi, to be the judge and jury, if you will, to execute judgment on not only the northern kingdom of Israel, but also the southern kingdom of Judah. And that's what we see here in verse 7. And according to verse 8, it happened when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, or the northern kingdom of Israel, and found the princes of Judah, the southern kingdom, and the sons of Ahaziah's brothers who served Ahaziah, that he killed them. Then, verse 9, he searched for Ahaziah, and they caught him. He was hiding in Samaria in the central region of Israel, and brought him to Jehu. When they had killed him, they buried him because they said he is the son of Jehoshaphat. Now, he's really the grandson of Jehoshaphat, uh, but by talking about Jehoshaphat, the writer is going back to the next godly king, we would say, which, of course, is his grandfather, Jehoshaphat, who sought the Lord with all his heart. So the house of Ahaziah had no one to assume power over the kingdom. So Jehoshaphat's grandson Ahaziah died, and the sixth king of Israel, or Judah rather, fades off of the scene. Now, real quickly, let's come to the third and final person we want to look at. We said there were two kings and one queen. In verses 10 through 12, in 2 Chronicles 22, we have the first queen of Judah. Her name is Athaliah, Athaliah. She reigned for six years from 841 to 835, and she, of course, is a very evil queen. According to verse 10 of 2 Chronicles 22, now when Athaliah... The mother of Ahaziah saw that her son was dead. She arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. Now, talking about all the royal heirs, these are all of her descendants. Now, remember, all of Ahaz, Ahaz, Ahaziah's brothers had died. So who are her descendants? Her grandchildren. Wow, I can't even begin to imagine killing my grandchildren. Children, maybe. <laughs> but, 
but, but not the grandchildren. But according to verse 11, Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king. Now, uh, Jehoshabeth is the daughter uh, of, of King Jehoram took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away. So one grandchild was spared. S stole him away from the king's sons who were being murdered and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada, the priest, not Jehoiada, the other fellow, but the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. And he was hidden with them in the house of the Lord, or house of God, for six years, while Athaliah reigned over the land. So here we see the wickedness of Athaliah. But it's important to note, Jehoshabeth, she took the lone heir, Joash, who will become very significant in chapter 23. More on that next time we're together. He'll become a very good king of Israel. Bring great reform to Judah, rather, not Israel. My, I'm sorry, to the southern kingdom. But what I found important to note is where Jehoshabeth hid him. She hid him, verse 12, in the house of God. She took him to the house of the Lord as a place of refuge, a place of safety, a place of security. Is it no wonder the writer of the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, 25, not to forsake the gathering of the saints. Look, when we come together, there's something special. There's something wonderful when we as the body of Christ get together. There's safety, there's security. It's a place of refuge and strength, if you will. <laughs> David said in Psalm 122, when I was glad when they said, let us go up into the house of the Lord. You know, I'm always so blessed to be able to come to church, to be able to hang out and fellowship one with another, to be able to worship the Lord through song, study the Lord through his word, to serve the Lord in and with each and every one of us here. And there's just some real safety in that. And me, for one, I am very, very thankful. Lord, you are so good. Lord, you're so gracious, so long-suffering, so faithful, Lord, even when we are faithless. And Lord, you <laughs> have given us this great honor, this great privilege to be able to come and gather together, Lord, in this place. Lord, we recognize that there's a lot of places around the world that, well, it's not safe to gather together. But yet when fellow brothers and sisters come together, no matter where it's at, there's safety. There's strength. It's a refuge. A place for us to just fall more in love with you. So, Lord, we recognize how special this place is and this time is. Oh, Lord, not, we're not talking about the building, but the gathering of us as the saints, no matter where we're at. Because, Lord, we recognize that the church isn't sticks and bricks. The church is flesh and blood. It's us, your children. So, Lord, help us never to forget the importance of gathering together. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? Next time we're together, chapter 23, make sure you read ahead. Should be a wonderful, wonderful time to be able to study the Word of God. And I do pray that God would bless each and every one of your hearts. That He would strengthen your hands, guide your feet. That He'd encourage you lead you, guide you, direct you. That he'd fill you with his spirit. And if you need prayer for anything at all, be sure to come on up. The pastors and brothers and sisters will be up here to pray with you, to pray for you. And Lord willing, Sally and I will see you in a couple of weeks. We're flying out tomorrow morning for Israel. 
So uh, catching the early bird out to uh, Tel Aviv. So we'll make sure we say hi to Shalom Almog for you and Ronnie Winter and the group over in Israel. So God bless you guys.